Greetings, everyone, and welcome to what I guess is the final holiday update, at least until I get my belated Christmas stuff from my dad and mom. <laughs> Alrighty, so today, uh, just got a small one for you, actually. Um, there's two uh, trade paperback collections that I picked up recently, one of which I forgot to include in the last update because it was sitting by my bed, because it's been my bedtime reading for the past few nights. And uh, the other of which uh, just arrived, actually, shortly after I did that update. So I thought, well, let's just do a little one and get these two out of the way so I can put them on the shelf where they belong. So let's check them out today on the Multimedia Chronicles. Welcome back. All right, so I got a couple from Marvel this time around. First up, as you know, I've been collecting uh, some of the Marvel Epic collections, and uh, this series in particular, because this is probably my all-time favorite Marvel character. And um, yeah, so Volume 3 just came out recently of The Incredible Hulk. So this volume is entitled The Leader Lives. Spoiler! Yeah, well, we all knew he wasn't dead for good when... Uh, he died in the previous volume. But uh, this one contains the last few issues of Tales to Astonish, uh, specifically numbers 97 through 101, uh, one of which actually uh, brings the two characters... Uh, normally there'd be half an issue devoted to one character, half an issue devoted to the Hulk. Um, so during this part of the run, it was Submariner would be one half, and then the Hulk would be the other half. So there was... Uh, for the 100th issue of Tales to Astonish... They actually had a, uh, a special double size spectacular here. Let me just see where, uh, yeah, here it is, where they actually had a full 20-page story or 22-page story in which the Submariner and the Hulk uh, finally had a rematch after many, 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 many years. So very cool stuff. And then uh, as of issue number 102... So let's see, hold on a second. 101 was the final issue of Tales to Astonish, and then both Submariner and the Hulk were paired off into their own individual comics. So issue number 102 was the premiere issue of The Incredible Hulk um, as a regular series. So uh, I think that confused a lot of people um, for a while there. But uh, basically they just picked up the numbering where Tales to Astonish left off, whereas the Submariner started with issue one after that. So go figure. I don't know why they didn't just... I guess because there was already an Incredible Hulk number one. There was the first six issues many moons ago. Um, interesting fun fact here. I used to own this issue. Um, I actually had a handful of um, the early issues of the Hulk. I had number 101... Or sorry, 102 and... Um, like 104 to 110 or something like that. I just had a small batch of them that I got fairly cheap. And um, sadly, I don't have them anymore. I sold them a long time ago. So it's nice to finally have this back in the collection. And especially nice to have been able to read all the stories that precede it. Because, of course, this one actually resolves a big epic story that started in the previous issue of Tales to Astonish. So if you started with this issue, you're coming in in the middle of a big massive story where the Hulk finds himself in Asgard for some reason. But uh, anyway, so this includes the last few Tales to Astonish issues. Uh, Incredible Hulk numbers 102 to 117. Incredible Hulk Annual number 1. And Not Brand Ech, number nine. So the artwork in this is primarily by uh, Marie Severin, who was an awesome, awesome artist from the 60s and 70s. And um, it also features the debut of Herb Trimp, who actually stayed with the series for many, 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 many years. So uh, pretty cool stuff. And the stories themselves are written by uh, Stan Lee. And then uh, he was uh, later... Uh, uh, Gary Friedrich uh, took over and was the writer for quite some time as well. So that's the first one. So really excited to get that into the collection because I've been just thoroughly enjoying uh, seeing the, the early adventures and the origins and evolution, that early evolution of the Incredible Hulk and seeing how it all evolved into the, you know, jolly green guy that we all know and love now. And then next up, this is the second of three volumes of a series that um, I think is one of the most underrated series of the late 80s, and uh, I always really enjoyed it. I actually have a full set of the original issues, but I wanted to get the uh, um, 
the uh, collected editions because the uh, the paper is higher quality than the old newsprint of the original issues and the color is a lot more vibrant and stuff. We have volume two of Strike Force Morituri. So this contains issues 14 through 26 of the original series and uh, really, really good stuff. Now, I've always said that um, this series was at its best when it was being helmed by the original creative team of Peter B. Gillis doing the writing and Brent Anderson doing the artwork. Those two just created magic. Um, and uh, they, they stuck with the series through the first 20 issues. And then from issues 21 onward, it was a new creative team uh, with writer James Hudnall and uh, kind of a rotation of artists until they settled on uh, one artist in particular. I think it was jo uh, Mark Bagley, if I remember correctly. Let me just take a look here. Um, was it Mark Bagley? Yes, it was Mark Bagley was the uh, regular artist through the majority of the rest of it. Now, Strike Force Moratoria, I think I mentioned this briefly when I uh, got Volume 1 a while back. Sadly, all three volumes are out of print now, so uh, they only did one print run, and that was it. And the third volume seems to be the hardest one to get, guessing it had a lower print run, not unusual for uh, short ones like that. But... Um, I really liked it a lot. It was kind of a science fiction superhero series, but that description does not do the concept justice. Basically, the, the general gist of it is like this. There's an alien invasion in the near future. Uh, there's this, these aliens, almost like space pirates, called the Horde that have come to Earth, and they're just pillaging and plundering everywhere and just wreaking havoc all over the planet and just ruining everything, killing people left and right. The military is ineffective, and as a last resort, the government decides to give the uh, go-ahead to implement the Morichuri process, which is an experimental process, uh, kind of a super soldier program where people can undergo this process and it unlocks, um, you know, goes through their DNA and unlocks any latent superpowers that they have. But there's a catch. This process is incredibly taxing to the system. There's, I guess, a reason why those powers are latent, namely that we haven't evolved enough as a species to be able to handle those powers. So when these powers are unlocked, um, it essentially burns up the body after a certain amount of time. The average lifespan of anyone who undergoes the process is about a year. Some die a little later, some die a little fa uh, sooner, depending typically on the how powerful their powers are. So the idea is to take volunteers to undergo this process, to go and fight the horde and just do as much damage as they can before they burn out and die. Um, now, the interesting thing about the comic was it was originally a monthly comic, and just as a month would pass between issues being published, a month would pass for the characters in the comic as well. So it was kind of like it was in real time. So that meant all these characters that you're being introduced to and getting to know and love would be gone about, you know, no more than a year later. Now, as a writer, that presents an interesting challenge because it doesn't allow for the same breathing space that a normal ongoing comic series would. Because normally you'd get to know these characters and their stories and come to love them and know them over the course of many years, sometimes decades. But no, here they would be gone within a year. And this is where I got to give the maddest of mad props to Peter B. Gillis as a writer because despite that extremely challenging, confining concept he pulls it off man like you that like honestly this is the first comic i can remember reading that actually literally moved me to tears in parts because you really get to know and love these characters even in that short period of time and you care so much about them and when it comes to be their time it hurts like you hate to see them go and um that's why i've always said like the first 20 issues in particular which were written by uh, by Peter B. Gillis, are just superb. And some of the, the finest, um, you know, mainstream comic book writing that I remember reading at that time. And, and it's such a shame that this series didn't get more recognition because I think it's really great. Now, when James Hudnell took over, now James Hudnell has done some great stuff over the years, but I think this is when he was still fairly new to the business. He hadn't quite honed his craft yet. He was saddled with this concept, and quite frankly, I think it was too much for him because what's one of the first things he did when he got the series... He found a cure for the Morituri process. Yeah, now you can just live a normal life, lifespan of a human, and keep all your superpowers. <sighs> that, like, just completely destroyed what made the series so interesting in the first place. 
And um, so he made his little set of characters and they just stuck around until the end of the series and there was no sense of urgency or anything. It really lost a lot when they introduced that fucking cure. So, and no surprise, the series died shortly afterwards. It only lasted like, I think, 11 more issues. They brought it back briefly with a five-issue prestige format miniseries called Electric Undertow. Um, and even that didn't resolve everything out. There was a lot of things left hanging. It just seemed to kind of meander off in all these directions and didn't really know what it was doing. Whereas in the original series, uh, the original 20 issues, it had a very definite focus and a very definite arc to it. And, um, and some absolutely outstanding character development. So if you can only find the first two volumes, don't worry about it. You've got all the issues that matter. <laughs> In fact, a lot of my friends that I've showed this series to just stop after issue 20. They'll take a little flip through issue 21, and it's like, wow, I can tell just by looking at it how much not good this is. Um, and they just kind of stop at issue 20, which, you know, if you stop there, it does work fine as uh, kind of an open-ended conclusion to the series. Um and often that's where I stop now with my rereadings. Like, I'll flip through some of the later issues, and it's like, yeah, no, it just, just isn't the same. So, anyway, Strike Force Moraturi. Great stuff. Love it. If you find it, grab it. You will not be disappointed. Alrighty, well, that is it for this update. Uh, only two things, so I thought I'd talk about them a little bit more. So, um, yeah, good stuff. Alrighty, that is it for me to you for now, folks. So thank you very much for watching. Big thanks to my Patreon sponsors. Be sure to join me on Twitch whenever you can. I stream almost every day. And uh, we'll see you next time. Until then, sayonara. Okie dokie. <clears throat>